spoils and ghouls. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at one of the most underrated artists of all time, in my opinion. While he's a well-known artist's artist, he's avoided lengthy runs on titles and eschewed higher-paying work on superheroes for more science fiction and adventure-oriented material throughout his career. While he might not be inordinately partial to the superhero genre, though, Michael Golden is without a doubt one of the most interesting, enigmatic, and influential artists of the half-past century in the medium, and this despite only having produced what amounts to a smattering of comics in a career spanning more than four decades at this point. Starting at Marvel and DC in the late 1970s before becoming a fan favorite and carving out a niche of his own as one of the most bitingly original illustrators to have ever worked in the field, with his groundbreaking runs on both the Micronauts and the Nom in the 1980s, Michael Golden has only ever done a handful of interviews during his entire career as well, and even many dedicated fans don't know much about the actual man behind the drawings or the stories surrounding the comics that made him a living legend. From his heights in the 1980s and early 90s as one of the most highly sought after cover artists in the industry, to his on again off again relationship with the industry and sudden disappearance, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the career of one of the most interesting men to have ever picked up the pen. So kick back for another tasty tidbit of tawdry industry trivia and a little tale I like to call Michael Golden, Patience is a Virtue. Remember, if you enjoy this video, do me a favor and hit that like button. Think about getting in the comments section below and letting me know if you really enjoy what you see. Make sure you hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to support the channel and help it grow, think about using the link in the description to sign up for my Patreon page, sign up for membership right here on YouTube, or pick up your very own jerk comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen. But now, let's get into it. Following the success of his painted covers for the title, Michael Golden finally relented and told editor Larry Hama that he would do an issue of G.I. Joe sometime around the beginning of 1985. At least, kind of. The thing is, when Michael Golden agreed to do the story, he says that he believed it was just another short backup feature like the ones that Larry Hama usually asked him for, not a full 22-page comic. After discovering the truth, feeling up to the challenge at the time despite the misunderstanding, Golden, who was still working full-time on a ranch as well as doing commercial art in his free time to make ends meet, rather reluctantly told Larry Hama that he would get the story done just as soon as he could, although he wasn't entirely sure when that would be. Golden says he would work days on the ranch and then come home and bang out as many pencils as he possibly could at his kitchen table before exhaustion set in and he basically ended up collapsing in a heap. He wasn't doing two pages a day, but according to Golden, things were progressing well enough at first. Before Golden managed to complete work on the story, though, he was offered the lucrative opportunity to drive a truck of cattle cross-country by the ranch that he was working for. The pay for the drive was several thousand dollars, as opposed to the several hundred dollars that he was going to get for the G.I. Joe story, and as you may have already guessed, Michael Golden took the cattle driving job almost immediately without even really thinking about it, only calling up Larry Hama afterwards to let him know that the story was going to take him a little longer than he had anticipated. Hama, who probably expected some sort of delay working with Michael Golden, as he had done far too much work with him by this point not to, was rather nonplussed and told Golden that he could get him an extension on the story as long as he agreed to get back to work on it as soon as he got back from the drive. When Michael Golden got home, which took more than a month, he says that he did get back to work on the G.I. Joe story, but that he was almost immediately offered another cattle driving job, which he also took. 
This time around, Golden apparently didn't even bother to let Hama know what was up, though. By the time that he got back from the second drive, Michael Golden says that it had been nine or ten months since he'd originally agreed to do the issue of G.I. Joe. Because Larry Hama had already gotten him an extension the first time, Golden says he basically assumed he just reassigned the story, which for the record is what Michael Golden says that he would have done in this situation. Golden has absolutely no idea why Larry Hama waited so long for him, but when he received a rather frantic phone call from him asking if there was any possible way that he could get to work on that G.I. Joe story ASAP all those months later, he discovered that rather than reassigning the work, Larry Hama had instead opted to ask for a second extension on the story, still banking on Michael Golden getting it done like he had promised nearly a year ago by that point. While this was shocking enough, what was even more unbelievable is that Larry Hama actually got the second extension from editorial. Hama had really stuck his neck out for Michael Golden and feeling kind of guilty that he'd waited for so long, Golden told him that he would have it done as soon as he possibly could. With full-time work on the ranch during the day, as well as still having to juggle other commercial work that he'd already agreed to, going was slow though. After no small amount of sleepless nights at his kitchen table and nearly a year of extensions, Golden did finally manage to get the story done sometime later that year. This time, Golden's story titled Triple Play definitely didn't end up languishing in a drawer for months on end, like so many of his other works though. Quite the opposite. Michael Golden says that Larry Hama was so desperate for him to get the story done that Triple Play was lettered and colored within a week, and that the G.I. Joe yearbook special issue 2 hit stands within a month of Marvel receiving his pencils. Yet again, despite all the obstacles and problems that he had faced creating it, or perhaps because of them, Triple Play would go on to be widely celebrated, not only as some of Michael Golden's best work, but without question, one of the greatest G.I. Joe stories of all time as well. Because the yearbook special was essentially completed after hours at Golden's kitchen table over a matter of more than 10 months, I obviously wouldn't call it a rush job like Michael Golden describes Doctor Strange 55, however. On the other hand, I definitely don't think he had a ton of time to be tender or delicate with the work either. Golden instead had to be cautious and intelligent when working on Triple Play, and it ended up taking a lot of time and effort just to ensure that the art looked cohesive, considering that it was done over the better part of an entire year. By the time that Golden really buckled down and had to get the book done, there was little time to excruciate over small things, and as always, while this could have negatively impacted the work, and it would have for a lot of other people, with Michael Golden it seems to have again kind of freed him from some of his more obsessive traits and ultimately resulted in one of his most celebrated works. Artists will constantly point to Triple Play as one of the pinnacles of what you can achieve with comic book art and storytelling, noting that in particular the attention to detail and the cartooning in that book are very nearly perfect, almost always completely unaware of the circumstances and the constraints surrounding the creation of the story. In fact, Triple Play, published in the G.I. Joe Yearbook Special, has probably inspired more artists to pick up a pin than any other single contemporary issue that I can think of. It's also worth mentioning, while I wasn't able to find any direct evidence to corroborate this, I know for a fact that Jim Lee was a massive Michael Golden art collector back in the day. Jim Lee bought up all the original Golden art that he possibly could when he was flush with all of that sweet X-Men and image cash back before he had kids in college, and apparently at some point, Jim Lee managed to score original art from Triple Play. Lee, whose Wildstorm Productions had actually just acquired the rights to G.I. Joe at the time, according to several reputable sources, proceeded to make photocopies of the original art 
and use it as the official Wildstorm G.I. Joe Bible. Regardless of this particular tale's validity, interest in the triple play story persists to this day, and we'll actually talk a little bit more about that later on, and it's fascinating to see just how influential this single issue has been over the years, especially considering how difficult it was for Michael Golden to get it done, and just how close it came to never seeing the light of day. While it was often the case, thankfully not everything that he worked on was this difficult for Michael Golden, and at least his shorter backup material was going fairly smoothly at the time. In fact, just after Bucky O'Hare came out, but prior to the release of the G.I. Joe yearbook special, in October of 1985, Michael Golden had released what at the time seemed to be just another short story, the Nam 1967, the fifth to the first. While no one could have known it at the time. This story, written by Doug Murray for the short-lived Marvel magazine Savage Tales, would lead to perhaps the defining title run in Michael Golden's illustrious career. While Golden is most assuredly extremely well-remembered for his much-beloved run on Micronauts at the start of his career, he would soon find himself, completely inadvertently I might add, working on one of the most highly lauded comics of the era and thrust into the limelight despite little interest in being involved with the comics industry as a whole by this point. While Michael Golden still refused to even publicly speak following the 1979 Wizard interview, his next project would even manage to generate some serious mainstream media attention in a time when that was almost entirely unheard of for comic books. Michael Golden was completely uninterested in the spotlight, however. Much like Steve Ditko, it seemed that Michael Golden wanted his work to do the talking for him, and he was simply intent on doing his job as well as he possibly could, telling a good story and making a living at it without having to deal with what he viewed as an increasingly toxic fan base. And speaking of a good story, the way that Golden's next and perhaps most beloved comic book run began is actually a really interesting story in and of itself. According to Michael Golden, writer Doug Murray had been turning in these short prose vignette stories to Larry Hama, who had become kind of obsessed with them. Unfortunately, as much as he liked them, Larry Hama had no clue what to do with Murray's stories and eventually showed them to Michael Golden kind of out of desperation. Larry Hama believed that Michael Golden might be one of the few men capable of translating what he thought were really interesting bits of prose into actual comic books. And as was often the case, as it happened, Larry Hama's instincts were dead on. Michael Golden absolutely nailed it. He not only successfully translated the first of Murray's writings into the fifth to the first story, but with several other stories already written and Michael Golden seeming to enjoy the work as well, Hama decided to make the fifth to the first stories an ongoing feature by the time that he received the second short, The Sniper, for Savage Tales issue four in March of 1986. Larry Hama just had to sell Michael Golden on the idea though. Initially reluctant, Golden, who was still working on the ranch and doing other commercial work at the time, as we discussed, didn't really want to commit to anything very serious. Hama, however, reassured him that not only were they just backups and that there wouldn't be a ton of pressure when it came to deadlines and that kind of thing, but that they were going to be in black and white. So Golden didn't even need to stress about doing the colors or someone else screwing up the job either. Despite this being what Larry Hama saw as one of the big selling points, this very nearly backfired on him. What Hama and most people don't realize is that while his books look amazing in black and white, drawing specifically for black and white is inordinately difficult and laborious for Michael Golden. This is apparently in large part due to the way that he lays out pages in his head before his pen ever hits the paper. This results in Michael Golden essentially 
thinking in color when it comes to his compositions, and it makes black and white work much more difficult for him as a result. Despite his reservations about the lack of color and being able to fit the stuff into his schedule to begin with, after some sweet talking, Larry Hama was able to eventually convince Michael Golden to agree to the fifth to the first backups. Sadly, however, I don't believe work on anything other than the first two stories that had already seen print was ever completed due to an unforeseen set of circumstances that quickly arose. Savage Tales got the axe not long after this in December of 1986, and with its cancellation came the death of the fifth to the first material as well, which as a result no longer had any place to call home. Michael Golden, still working on the ranch, had seemingly been bitten by the comic bug again, though. In his words, he, quote, had one of those periods where he wanted to tell stories again. This interest would most likely have been turned towards his Savage Tales backups, but with that avenue now gone to him and nothing else of any weight in the works at the time, Golden was left wanting for some work inside of the comic book industry for the first time in a very, very long time. Obviously, Michael Golden's not the most prolific guy on the planet, to say the least. However, this isn't because people didn't try to get him to do more work. It was just hard as hell to get him to agree to much of anything outside of covers and random backup work. While he was in the mood to tell stories, as he puts it, though, Dick Giordano, just happened to call him up completely out of the blue and offered him not only work, but an ongoing monthly gig on a Batman title. While most artists would be elated, this wasn't really the case for Michael Golden. He has never been a fan of the superhero genre, but he still wanted to tell stories at the time, and Michael Golden explains that he basically had to talk himself into agreeing to taking the offer. He reasoned the Batman wasn't really a superhero book, that it was only kind of a cape and cowl thing, and that he was actually more of a detective than anything else. I think that Michael Golden had enjoyed his time on the Bat Family books in the 1970s enough that with the fifth to the first material dead in the water and a desire to tell stories, he eventually took Giordano up on his offer, although Golden would never even start work on a single page before things fell apart. Now, if you're wondering why you've never read this second run on Batman, that would be because apparently Michael Golden's phone rang the very next day. On the other end of the line was Larry Hama, who had been tipped off that Michael Golden was going to be taking over a Batman title by none other than Denny O'Neill himself, who I don't think was personally super jazzed about the idea. Hama launched into a massive speech about how Michael Golden didn't really want to be doing a Batman book. He didn't want to be doing a superhero book. He wanted to be doing an adventure book, a war book. Michael Golden wanted to be doing something that he could really sink his teeth into. And Larry Hama told him he knew that wasn't a Batman book. He then proceeded to pitch Michael Golden on what Michael Golden describes as a war book that Marvel was supposedly working on in something of a desperate gamble to get him to drop his work for DC and continue working with Hama at Marvel in the face of Savage Tales cancellation. While the exact details of that pitch that Michael Golden received are kind of lost to time, and they differ more than a little slightly depending on who's telling the story, Golden recalls the series was basically sold to him as a historical fiction that dealt with the Vietnam conflict in most interviews that I could find. Golden says it sounded a little bit cobbled together, but that it was interesting enough that by the time that they hung up, he knew he wasn't going back to Batman. Unfortunately, Michael Golden had apparently actually been trying to get a few different projects off of the ground with DC since his departure from the company during the 1978 implosion with no luck, and after what soon followed, it would be a while before he did anything with them again, though. Michael Golden says this was basically because less than 24 hours after accepting the Batman assignment, he essentially burnt all of his bridges. 
by calling Giordano back to tell him that he wouldn't be taking over Batman, but instead going back to work for Marvel and on a completely untested war book nonetheless. While it's probably safe to say that Larry Hama did have a good pitch for him on the phone, it's also highly likely that Golden agreed in large part simply because their proposed series wasn't a superhero book. Golden had also enjoyed working with Larry Hama and had particularly enjoyed the work that they had been doing with Doug Murray on the fifth to the first material and was likely interested in continuing a working relationship that he was already familiar with and that he felt confident would continue to result in good stories. That being said, it is worth noting that while the work that would follow would seem to be a logical extension in a lot of ways of the fifth to the first material, the one thing that Doug Murray, Michael Golden, and Larry Hama can seem to agree on is that the NOM was not a continuation or even remotely connected to the fifth to the first material. While they might all agree on that, the origins of the NOM are something that apparently no one can agree on. War books had been deader than dead for years. No one was really interested in them prior to the 1980s when Larry Hama managed to breathe life into a dying, if not essentially dead genre in many ways with his work on G.I. Joe. While getting other adventure or war material that wasn't based on licensed properties off of the ground like Savage Tales often proved to be a difficult undertaking, it was something that Larry Hama was obviously intent on as well. While it's usually not difficult to discern when someone is kind of obfuscating the truth or misremembering things, when you're given three entirely different sets of events that led to the same place, that's not the case. As such, I'm going to provide a little rundown on the differing accounts as well as provide some thoughts on what I personally think actually happened. According to Michael Golden, while Larry Hama made good on his word and basically immediately went to Jim Shooter or whoever and made the series happen in a matter of only a few days, the series that Larry Hama pitched him on, which would soon become the NOM, was entirely made up on the spot in order to stop him from accepting the Batman assignment and keep him at Marvel instead. This sounds a little unlikely in my opinion. Well beloved indeed, Larry Hama has just never seemed to have that level of pull at Marvel or anywhere else. It's possible this is true given things radically changed between their initial conversations and the series actually seeing print in Golden's eyes, although what precisely was actually altered is kind of unclear considering how Golden has described Hama's initial pitch in every interview that I've ever found. There doesn't seem to be an inordinate amount of difference between a historical war book set in Vietnam and what eventually saw a publication, but Michael Golden said in interviews, quote, that was another one of those stories where I was, I'll go ahead and use the words, suckered into agreeing to something, to a project that almost immediately became something else that I didn't agree to. Larry Hama remembers things a slight bit differently, to say the least, though. According to Larry Hama, the NOM was essentially an editorial mandate directly from Jim Shooter. In an interview with Back Issue, Hama revealed he had just been sitting in his office one day when Jim Shooter walked in with a cover mock-up that he shoved into his face. The illustration was a, quote, color copy of a G.I. Joe cover featuring a man in camouflage obscured by foliage and the name The Nam pasted over the top of the page. According to Larry Hama, Jim Shooter had basically handed him the picture, and told him to invent a series to go along with it, saying that he had nothing to do with the idea, nor did he have any intention of launching a monthly series about the Vietnam conflict prior to Jim Shooter's intervention. Larry Hama also argued that Michael Golden's line of events didn't really add up. Hama himself says that he didn't have that kind of power, and he might have been able to sell Jim Shooter the non-series if he had known about the fifth to the first material. Hama, however, highly doubts that Jim Shooter was even aware of the two short backups from Savage Tales 
one of Marvel's flagging and oft ignored black and white magazines, which Jim Shooter personally tended to look down on in general anyway, and had been canceled after only eight issues to boot. Because of this, Larry Hama says he wouldn't have had anything to pitch Jim Shooter with. I will say that I find this line of events kind of unlikely as well. It just seems plain weird that Jim Shooter would suggest a series based on the Vietnam conflict basically out of the blue in 1986. I can see him maybe wanting something Joe adjacent, but coming in and plopping down a G.I. Joe cover and asking for an action adventure series centered around the Vietnam conflict strikes me as extremely strange. If all of this were not confusing enough, writer Doug Murray has an entirely different account of what transpired as well. Doug Murray says that there was a pitch for a series based on the Vietnam conflict that came from Larry Hama, at least partially. Murray says that the pitch had nothing to do with keeping Michael Golden at Marvel and was instead based on Hama's affection for the fifth to the first material. Hama was such a big fan of the backups, which had been cut short following the cancellation of Savage Tales, just as he was really trying to get it off of the ground, that Murray says Hama approached him with the idea of putting together a proposal for some sort of ongoing title that was loosely related to the same kind of concept. Murray claims that he came up with the idea for the nom, and that after some fine-tuning the concept with Larry Hama, he and Hama pitched it to Jim Shooter. Murray did not expect much from the meeting, though, and he was absolutely shocked when they actually got the go-ahead for the series instead of getting laughed out of Jim Shooter's office like he expected. While this certainly sounds like the least far-fetched of these rather one-sided accounts, I'm still not entirely convinced that this is how things went down. In my opinion, the most likely series of events is that everyone is actually telling the truth but that it happens to be somewhat obfuscated by the passage of 30 years of time, and it's possible that both Michael Golden and Doug Murray, in particular, are simply remembering the same story from entirely different perspectives. If Larry Hama did come up with the non-pitch on the fly, regardless of whether this was to keep Michael Golden from doing Batman or not, it's totally plausible that rather than doing all the footwork of coming up with a completely new series on his own, he went to Doug Murray after his conversation with Michael Golden and asked Murray to help him to come up with a pitch for Jim Shooter based on the loose ideas that he had used to sell Michael Golden already without ever even telling Doug Murray that's what was going on. This seems like a bit of a stretch, though, in particular because the short time that it took Larry Hama to get the nom approved, if Murray already had something sitting around or in mind, perhaps based on the planned work for the Savage Tales backups, it's not totally out of the realm of possibility that Larry Hama had used ideas at least loosely based around them either to pitch Michael Golden. I also know for a fact that Larry Hama did really like the fifth to the first material, so it's also completely logical to think that he could have possibly already been working on the rough ideas and loose outlines of what would become the nom prior to talking with Michael Golden and kind of tossed that out at Michael Golden in a last ditch effort to get him to turn down the Batman book without really having something ready to go. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure how things went down with the NUM, and considering how conflicting these stories are, I don't know if we'll ever know for sure. Personally, I don't see coming up with a book on the spot to stop Michael Golden from leaving Marvel alone. I also highly doubt that Jim Shooter was aware of the fifth to the first shorts, and it's a rather dubious prospect, Jim Shooter demanding a war book about the Vietnam conflict, a genre which had notoriously been flagging for decades. Again, the most likely story would be that Larry Hama had a soft spot for the backup material, and whether he remembers it or not, or even meant to, he helped Doug Murray design and pitch a series at least loosely based on that same kind of concept and premise to Jim Shooter. Your guess is as good as mine, though, to be honest. 
Regardless of how the series came to be, though, even in the face of all the difficulties that the book had from the onset being a war book alone, the nom would go on to garner both fan and critical attention. In fact, I don't think anyone involved with the book ever saw it coming. And I'm not trying to crap on war books or imply that there weren't good titles out there either, by the way. It just seems obvious that publishers did not want to put any time or money into war action or adventure books, despite creators often loving to work on them. When they did get actual talent and put out those types of books, they couldn't even seem to be bothered to properly promote or maintain them, and it feels like a lot of those titles were just left to kind of languish in obscurity and only really publish because of the creative team pushing for them at the publishing house until they relented to begin with. While this obviously meant that most of these books had a pretty short lifespan, it also meant that for the most part, you were left to your own devices. There were no real sales expectations from these types of books, and while people were expected to keep books on schedule and budget, they weren't in competition with mainstays like Spider-Man or the X-Men. Because of all of this, even once they got the go-ahead on the series, no one involved with the NOM expected it to last more than half a dozen issues, at most. A whopping eight years and 84 issues later, in 1993, when the series finally came to an end, if one thing was clear, however, it was that this had not been the case. One reason for its longevity is the fact that the NOM wasn't successful just because of any single factor. There were as many readers who seemed to come for Michael Golden's art as Doug Murray's writing, but the important thing was that it actually brought a lot to the table as a package deal, and rather than relying solely on either man's prior readership, the NOM managed to bring a lot of new readers into the fold almost immediately. One of the most interesting things about the NOM, and something that not only set the series apart at the time, but also garnered a fair bit of attention, was that while it might have been done before, I'm not personally aware of any other monthly publications that essentially took place in real time. While it might sound a little trivial today, or even like a gimmick, this was one of the big hooks for the NOM in large part because a real-time narrative meant that there would be a constantly revolving cast of characters. Just as in real life, some would be killed while others shipped out and headed home after they completed their tours of duty. This alone made the NOM unlike virtually any other Marvel or DC book on the stands at the time. It was an interesting concept, and the NOM would ultimately also prove to be a really unique way to examine the Vietnam conflict as well. A decade after the end of the events that they were fictionally chronicling, the NOM was told through the eyes of a society that wasn't necessarily nostalgic, but were in many ways still attempting to cope with the memory and knowledge of what had happened with Vietnam. The thing about the Vietnam conflict that had been unlike any other armed conflict we had been involved with prior to this was that it wasn't just soldiers who were confronted with the harsh and often grisly sights of the battlefield. Yes, there had long been wartime photography and journalism, and snippets and snapshots of what had happened during World War II especially had trickled back home, but it wasn't until the Vietnam conflict that technology caught up with man's seeming preoccupation with the absolute horrors of war. As a result, it was the first to be basically publicly broadcast on television, and there was still a lot of people looking for ways to come to terms with what they had seen and heard. This most certainly appears to be the case for Michael Golden, who never served, but for whom Vietnam never seemed to be too far from mind either. On top of trying to generally cope, Michael Golden espouses a deep and abiding distaste for pop culture and, in particular, the way that media is handled in this country. He feels it's constantly presenting a sometimes treacherous and always skewed version of the world that we live in. This is most problematic for the children and young adults who, know it or not, are absorbing all of these ideas until eventually it alters how they see and perceive things in sometimes dangerous ways. 
For Michael Golden's own generation, this is probably no better personified than by the nightly horrors that the public were confronted with on the news while being provided little or no context for the gruesome images invading their television sets when it came to the Vietnam conflict. Judging from his work on the fifth to the first material and his statements about it, this was something that Michael Golden clearly wanted to address with the NOM, but often due to the constraints imposed by the Comics Code Authority, found himself unable to do. While, as stated, all parties involved insist that the NOM is completely unrelated to the fifth to the first material, it turns out that Larry Hama and Doug Murray hadn't been the only ones pushing for more material from their previous collaboration, however. Michael Golden not only thought that the fifth to the first stories were good, but he believed that they were important as well. In fact, Michael Golden was interested enough in continuing that work that he had actually lobbied to do a graphic novel based on the fifth to the first work after the cancellation of Savage Tales and prior to signing on for the NOM. In interviews, when looking back on this material, while Michael Golden seems to actually really like the NOM and is pretty happy concerning the success that it achieved, it's also pretty apparent that he feels like the fifth to the first stories were important, and he deeply yearned that they'd been allowed to do more of them instead. While they obviously deal with much of the same subject matter, one of the main reasons that it appears that Michael Golden felt this way was due to Hama and Murray's choice to submit the nom to the Comics Code Authority. This effectively hobbled a great many story elements that could have been dealt with, as well as limited the language they were allowed to use, and it even limited Golden's visual lexicon. None of these are good things for a war book by any estimation, but there were definitely trade-offs that came with the decision that benefited the book as well. While the Comics Code Authority meant that a lot of stuff was off of the table and couldn't even be alluded to in the NOM, Hama and Murray both felt this was a necessary evil in order to get the book out to as wide an audience as possible, firmly believing that the book had some real legs to stand on if they could just get it in front of the right people. It was a hell of a gamble, but as it turned out, they were not wrong. While effectively neutering the subject matter to make it acceptable for the Comics Code Authority could have severely undermined the integrity of the entire series in any number of ways, and it did limit what they could deal with, the gamble ended up paying off in spades. In a time when there was virtually no mainstream media coverage concerning comic books, while Michael Golden still preferred to issue the spotlight, Larry Hama and Doug Murray were interviewed by both local CBS and CBN affiliates when issue one was sent out for review. The CBS and CBN interviews were impressive and started something of a movement, garnering more and more attention for the series. But it was when the Washington Post had their former Saigon bureau chief, a legitimate expert in the actual Vietnam conflict, do a review of the NOM, and not as a comic, but as if the NOM were a novel or any other serious type of publication that things really blew up, because that's what this was, a serious publication. The positive review by the Times appears to have quite literally opened the floodgates, and within six months, there had been more than a hundred articles appearing in nearly every major newspaper in the country. And this was on top of the no less than three network news interviews about the NOM conducted around the same time as well. While in some cases, media coverage and hype doesn't necessarily translate into actual sales or popularity, when the first issue of the NOM was released in December of 1986, it managed to outsell X-Men that month, and the month after that, and the month after that as well. It's hard to believe looking back, but the NOM not only actually managed to defy expectations, but outperform a number of Marvel's biggest and most firmly entrenched titles. No one saw it coming, and the NOM blew in like some sort of hurricane, accumulating both fan and critical praise, as well as earning more than its fair share of kind words, 
from actual veterans who appreciated the series and it's serious, but not overly violent or in your face approach to the subject matter. One of the other big things, aside from the general treatment of the conflict that many vets and other wartime aficionados appreciated about the NOM was Michael Golden's artwork for the NOM. In particular, many marveled at Golden's meticulous eye for detail when it came to drawing both accurate weaponry and vehicles. Michael Golden, by this point, was notoriously picky about his work and certainly took his time on certain aspects of the series, constantly butting heads with editorial and some of his co-workers in the process as a result. This was in large part because of seemingly small but extremely time-consuming stuff like making sure he was drawing the right kind of flash suppressor on the M16s in each issue. Apparently, flash suppressors changed designs between 1967 and 1968, and Michael Golden felt that this was something that needed to be accurately represented on the page in real time. And to be fair, while this might seem a bit excessive to some people, it was little things like this that not only set Michael Golden's art apart, but the NOM by association as well, because they actually didn't go unnoticed, if you can believe it or not. It is also important to remember that while this kind of attention to detail does require a somewhat higher degree of knowledge and research for Golden on the front end, to say the least, because of his associative memory, once he has a decent understanding of a particular weapon or vehicle, or even type of weapon or vehicle in general, he is able to draw an extraordinarily convincing facsimile without much trouble. This isn't to undercut the fact that this stuff took him way longer than it maybe should have for a monthly book, and it drove a lot of the people that he worked with up the wall, or the amount of research and work that Michael Golden put into certain aspects like this on the series before he ever even started work on it either, because there was apparently a good bit of that. As always, for Michael Golden, figuring out how something works is seemingly a big part of being able to accurately reproduce it, and weapons don't seem to be any exception to this rule. As such, Michael Golden wasn't just concerned with the shape and the form of weapons, he also felt like he needed to possess a solid understanding of what using them was like. In particular, Golden was interested in how someone would look and act while firing them. This is why, despite not being a gun nut by any stretch of the imagination, Golden has actually spent a good amount of time handling and firing a number of different firearms, going so far as to learn to assemble and disassemble basically every weapon that he's used. While he might have constantly had his back up against the wall as far as actually creating the art because the NOM was a monthly book, and Golden certainly had to make some major changes in his style and how he approached the series as a result, he utterly refused to budge on the small things that he felt were integral to the title. Which to Michael Golden was apparently stuff like the flash suppressors being correct for the period. As I mentioned, it wasn't just the arsenal he was interested in accurately portraying either, however, and Michael Golden paid the same kind of attention to the vehicles that were featured in the NOM as he did the weapons. In particular, people still are amazed at the way that Michael Golden was able to capture the motion of helicopters in particular, but the tanks, jeeps, and other vehicles were pretty incredible as well. While the novice reader might have no idea the time and effort that went into assuring that these things were being drawn correctly, or even if they were drawn right, it certainly didn't go unnoticed by a lot of people who still praise the book for these reasons. This included a good number of veterans who were really integral in spreading the word about the NOM outside of the comic book community and were pretty vocal about their support of the book despite not being devout comic book readers prior to the release of the NOM. Interestingly, while it's highly accurate and one of the most technically detailed things that he ever drew in regards to the weapons and the vehicles, as I mentioned, there were deadline problems and Michael Golden had to completely alter his drawing style accordingly. 
Michael Golden says that, as with the majority of his work for Marvel, almost as soon as he agreed to do the nom, he was informed that he was behind schedule. As a result, just like his time on Micronauts, Golden spent the entirety of his run on the nom trying to keep up with deadlines and simply get something out on the stands on time. Also like Micronauts, the nom pushed Golden's art to some very interesting places when compared to his earlier work, and it impacted the rest of his career in some really interesting ways. Much of Golden's work that preceded the nom was heavily rendered and much more realistic, whereas with the nom, while the settings and details are almost all dead on and appear to be super realistic, the people in particular have a much more cartoonish and expressive look than was the norm for Golden's comic work prior to this point. For a lot of artists, this change might have proven disastrous or difficult, but it accomplished two things at once for Michael Golden here, simultaneously lifting a bit of the load as he didn't have to excruciate over details and rendering like he usually did, and instead allowing him to utilize more cartooning and character in their stead. This in turn had the unintended side effect of lightening the tone of what could have otherwise been a pretty oppressive book. Beginning in 1986, following on the heels of the success of books like Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, the Nam had every right to be a dark and gritty look at the Vietnam conflict, featuring hyper-violence and overly detailed art showcasing every leaf and shell casing in sight. This, however, was not what the book was about, and Golden's approach to the design allowed for a more reverent and respectful view of the period, effective yet capable of lightening the heavy blows and subject matter dealt with by the book simultaneously. I also think that rather interestingly, despite Golden's wish that they had continued on with the fifth to the first material and sidestepped the Comics Code Authority due to story element and language issues that they faced on the NOM, Golden refused to draw overly gruesome or gory panels either way. Golden refused to be a part of glorifying or making violence cool in any way, shape, or form, something that he still staunchly sticks to his guns about decades later as well. This apparently ties back into his negative view of popular culture and the way that violence is presented, or rather more often than not, venerated in the media that Golden wants no part of. Sadly, because he says it started behind schedule to begin with, despite his best efforts, as the nom pushed on, Golden fell further and further behind. As a result, Golden says that his pencils obviously got looser and looser as well, and more work eventually fell to his anchors. And I think we all remember Golden's scathing comments regarding the anchors that he's worked with. Original nom anchor Armando Gill, who was also notoriously slow, naturally fell almost immediately behind schedule as well, apparently attempting to do Golden's pencils justice and keep him happy, but only succeeding in further complicating matters ultimately as a result. While Gill tried to capture all of the raw energy and the detail of Golden's pencils, judging from what he said regarding inkers that he's worked with, I'm not entirely sure that Michael Golden was pleased with the results either way. This despite the fact that Gill was killing himself trying to render and refine every little detail that Michael Golden included in his intricate pencils. I know editorial were not happy about Gill's taking so long, and it was virtually no time before Gill was let go with issue three. There was then a fill-in issue by Pepe Marino before Marvel brought on their ringer, Secret Wars legend John Beatty, who would handle inks from the fifth issue on. With all of the changes being made, there was definitely some behind-the-scenes tension going on concerning the art from both sides, although I don't know if for Golden's part this was due to Armando Gill being let go, or his displeasure with both Gill and Beatty's work on the series. I say this because in contemporaneous interviews with Doug Murray, it appears that Michael Golden was upset that John Beatty wasn't inking all of the insane small details that he was putting into the art, and I know that Gil actually ended up getting the axe because he was at least trying to do precisely that, although given Golden's scathing comments about inkers, it's somewhat unclear if he ever thought that Gil even came close to achieving this goal. 
To Golden, nothing he put on paper was needless, and I think it became something of a vicious cycle, with Golden fighting to keep as much detail as he could, which is a large part of what was bringing the series so much prominence, I might add, but falling further and further behind schedule as a result, and Marvel trying anything and everything that they possibly could to get one of their most popular new titles onto the stands in time. Before inordinately long, it reached the point that Michael Golden was either going to have to straight have fill-in issues done for him or just do rough layouts. Michael Golden chose to go the route of layouts since he was getting looser and looser trying to keep up with things as the series went along anyways. Although Golden has says he did feel like Larry Hama was able to find people to competently finish his work for the most part, he claims he was providing little more than glorified thumbnails by the time that he left the series a little over a year later with issue 11 in October of 1987. Although Michael Golden himself doesn't appear to be overly impressed with the work, I think that if you look, you can start to see some monumentally important stuff happening with his art as Michael Golden picked apart and analyzed every second of time that he was allowed at the drawing board. The art is simultaneously carefree and cartoonish while remaining firmly entrenched and planted in reality and not straying too far so as to distract the reader from the seriousness of the subject matter at hand. Luckily, while most artist editions are not only expensive but difficult to find, if you're a fan of the NOM, I highly recommend checking out the black and white magazine-sized reprints that Marvel did a little bit under a year later, collecting Michael Golden's entire run on the series in the oversized format, which is an absolute feast for the eyes of fans. Golden had long since earned a reputation for not being the best at meeting deadlines and perhaps not being the easiest guy in the world to work with, to put it lightly, but the nom was like a nail in the coffin in these regards. It seemed like every project that he worked on for Marvel was perpetually behind schedule and fell further and further behind until he eventually tossed in the towel and just quit. This is kind of true, but even if a fraction of what Michael Golden is saying is true, I'm not entirely sure it's fair to lay blame squarely on his shoulders. Also, for the record, I think that it's important to note here that despite all of the whispers and all of the supposed tales that surround Michael Golden, I was only able to find a handful of instances where I really felt like the story lived up to the hype of this legendarily cantankerous creator. Michael Golden personally constantly talks about how he's, quote, not the easiest guy to work with and how he's made numerous enemies this way over the years, but I couldn't find stories from basically anyone willing to go on record and slam on Michael Golden, except for Doug Murray. And from what I can tell, Doug Murray definitely seems to be one of those guys who did not have the easiest time working with Michael Golden. But unlike other people, Murray, however, did actually speak up about this and in some detail in at least one interview over the years. Again, I think it is important to note that despite his critiques, Murray also goes out of his way to note just how much Michael Golden puts into his work and how he deeply and truly appreciates that fact despite the problems and the hardships that arise as a result of it sometimes. Doug Murray obviously respects Michael Golden and his work a lot from the interviews, which makes it more than a little ironic that he's not only one of the few people I found who spoke up about his troubles with Golden, but went so far as to quite literally call him crazy in a published interview Murray says in the interview that Golden was, quote, a really strange guy to work with. He describes himself as crazy, and he's absolutely right. He's a really fine artist who can do just about anything, but he's incredibly single-minded and gets totally obsessive about what he's doing. One of the problems we had with him early on in the book is that he'd spend days doing two or three pages so that every detail would be absolutely correct in the pencils. 
Then the inker would get them and the details would disappear anyway or not show up in the final printing. And he wasn't making his deadlines. So we had him change his style a bit and make things a little simpler. And that's worked out fairly well. He's working with an inker named John Beatty who lives within 10 minutes drive of Mike's home in Florida. So now the problem is that Michael Golden is standing over John Beatty's shoulder while Beatty inks to make sure that he's doing it the way that Mike likes it. And he's not getting time to do his penciling. He's a really interesting guy to work with because there's always something new coming out of him. And he turns out beautiful work, but he can be really exasperating at the same time. You never know what's going to happen next. He's a perfect guy for the book though, because he really loves the Vietnam War era and he knows everything about the gear, more than I do. It shows in the pages. He's a very good storyteller. I mean, yes, Murray appears to be repeating something that Michael Golden jokingly said to him and he's obviously not seriously calling Michael Golden crazy in the literal sense, Doug Murray goes out of his way to compliment Michael Golden's work as much as hammer on him, but he also makes it clear that Golden is not easy to work with, that he knows it, and that there's been a great deal of effort put into keeping him on track and preventing him missing deadlines behind the scenes, which has been extremely stressful for everyone. In Murray's defense, I think that if you read the interview as a fan of Michael Golden, the piece comes off as overall positive about him and his contributions to the NOM. To the uninitiated, however, this was going to paint a somewhat neurotic picture of Golden and scare a lot of people off, especially because these kinds of stories had started to become sort of like an albatross hanging around Golden's neck, following him around by the end of 1987 when he left the NOM, which again, I don't think necessarily is totally fair. On one hand, Michael Golden was known for his ex excruciating attention to detail and exceptionally intricate art in a medium that thrives on meeting maddening deadlines and extraordinarily short production times by ignoring all of these things in order to simply get product out onto the market. On the other hand, he was being punished and publicly scrutinized because of the very proclivities that drove him to produce such astounding work and were playing a large part in the positive critical and fan reception that the NOM was enjoying. It was a total catch-22. On top of the deadline difficulties, which again, Murray unfortunately seems to have gone out of his way to talk about in interviews when discussing the work, Michael Golden was also developing a reputation for having a absolute lack of respect for the work that he did in the comics medium. Having someone like Doug Murray call him crazy at this point, which although obviously I don't think was malicious, was not a good thing either though. In fact, stories about Michael Golden began to circulate that painted him as an eccentric, egotistical, and impossible to deal with prima donna, or should I say stories about stories. Again, despite everything you'll hear about him and all of my digging, I was only able to come up with a handful of negative things that people actually had to say about him on the record. The fact that Golden refused to do interviews and had been involved in a number of highly anticipated projects that were canceled without reason, only helped to add fuel to the growing fire and his growing reputation, however. While it's obvious, there are some interesting stories about Golden out there that I was not able to get details about, just judging from the 2006 panel that he did with Jason Pearson, which was the only place that I could actually find where anyone even really approached alluding to stuff like this. I feel like the better part of these tales about Michael Golden are rather exaggerated and stem mostly from two things. First, Michael Golden is protective of the quality of his work, vocal about this and does not compromise when it comes to his work without a fight. The second is that he's very vocal about not liking the comic book industry. Golden has never felt like he was treated exceedingly well in the industry and actively tries to dissuade many people from entering the field to this very day. There were a lot of fans and even other professionals that took great umbrage at Golden's disparagement of the industry and they took a general disliking to the guy simply because of this fact. 
This was not helped by the fact that basically every written piece about him seemed to play up these stories to one degree or another, although they never gave details, and Golden for his own part didn't seem to care, still refusing interviews and avoiding the public eye as much as possible. As such, these sort of urban legends began to develop around Michael Golden and erode what was left of his credibility with a lot of people. One such myth, which unbelievably was actually bolstered by one of the few interviews that Michael Golden ever did grant, done for a Wizard Magazine article published in 1997, was that rather than sell, keep, or even give away his original art, Michael Golden simply destroyed it. To draw the parallel again, I'd heard similarly untrue and insane stories about Steve Ditko, who was just as notoriously private and difficult to work with, and in both cases, found the root of what were nothing more than exaggerated urban legends, and in this case, there were actually two. The first and foremost is actually the wizard article in question itself. Little more than a sensationalist industry rag, I don't think that journalistic integrity was necessarily at the top of the list when putting together a piece for the magazine, unfortunately. As a result, perhaps one of the most bizarre rumors about Michael Golden seemed to once and for all be confirmed in the pages of the only interview that he had given in nearly 20 years years. According to the Wizard interview, quote, you won't find writer-artist Michael Golden hitting the convention circuit to promote his new Topps miniseries, Jackie Chan Spartan X. It's not that he's shy or especially dislikes fans, but rather that he so dislikes the worshipful approach to the industry's artists and their work. So much so that when a publisher returns original artwork to him, he doesn't save or sell most of it, he rips it up. Written in 1997, almost 30 years later, while there's not an inordinate amount of original art from Michael Golden out there, we know that this simply is not true. However, shockingly, while I think this is a dramatic oversimplification of the situation, apparently Wizard wasn't entirely wrong here either, and there was a precedent for this bold claim which appears to have given rise to this strange claim to begin with. It might sound kind of unbelievable that Michael Golden would destroy his original artwork rather than do something even remotely productive like sell it, and the rationale offered for this over the years was always that Michael Golden, who is a commercial artist and sees very little intrinsic value in his work once it's achieved its purpose in seeing publication or whatever, simply did not place the same kind of value on his art as other people and would essentially lose or destroy the originals returned to him out of ambivalence rather than any sort of malevolence. Again, going back to the same type of stories that you heard circulated about Steve Ditko in these regards, it was just kind of assumed that Michael Golden hated comics so much and cared so little about his work that he couldn't be bothered to properly store or care about his artwork and it was callously left to rot instead. This fact became so widely known that it was actually published as the first lines of the first interview that Michael Golden had done in 20 years. While I doubt that Michael Gold never actually saw the interview, as he was obviously uninterested and only doing it at the behest of his manager and longtime friend Renee Witterstatter, if he did see it, he did little or nothing to downplay the laughably outlandish claims of the opening lines. And that's exactly what they were, by the way, laughable. While most people look at Golden's work and think this guy must love comics, according to Golden, the quality of his work has nothing to do with his love of the medium which he seems to kind of go out of his way to crap on and discourage other artists from entering into in most cases. In his own words, Michael Golden has no sentimental, no nostalgic connection with his comic book art and instead seems to simply suffer from something of a compulsion to do the absolute best possible job that he can on every single thing that he ever agrees to work on. There's nothing loving or tender about the process of creation for Michael Golden, and he does not seem to suffer from the same deep-seated desire that most comic book artists do of simply working in the industry. One analogy that I heard him use several times was that designing a soup can label and making a comic are virtually the same thing to him. It is simply work that he is paid to do and therefore does. This seemingly rather unenthused take on his own work, as well as a general disinterest in the comic book industry and selling his original artwork after a certain point, 
led to a common misconception that Michael Golden didn't care about his art, which again, simply is not true. As I said, however, there is a grain of truth to Wizard's claims, and I was able to track down what I think are essentially the backbones of this urban legend. While Michael Golden refused to say when this took place, or even who the anchor was in the story that I think is most heavily responsible for these tall tales, he did say that these events transpired while working on a DC project where he was having a bunch of trouble with an unnamed anchor. For those that don't know, when an issue is completed, artwork is broken up and distributed to people who worked on the book. These days, artists usually keep their original art, but back in the day, it was often split up between pencilers, inkers, and even letterers. Golden says that even though everyone involved had already agreed upon how the pages were going to be split up once they were returned, this inker apparently changed his mind and started having misgivings at some point. The inker then reportedly repeatedly called Michael Golden complaining about how he'd had to do the lion's share of the work on the series not Michael Golden. The inker felt like this therefore entitled him to more pages than had initially been agreed upon and started insisting that Michael Golden send him certain pages from the book. Now, if you've ever seen Michael Golden's finished pencils, which is what he said he provided for this project, then you know that there's almost no way that this is true. I think if you've been paying attention by this point, you also probably know that while I don't believe he's a necessarily needlessly confrontational or aggressive guy, Michael Golden does not appear to suffer fools lightly, and he's not afraid to stand up for himself when need be either. Tired of arguing about the dispensation of art at a certain point, rather than continue to fight about it, Michael Golden says that he took the pages in question, tore them into shreds, stuffed the remains into a box, and mailed them to the quote-unquote greedy anchor who demanded them. Is this an extreme reaction? Most definitely. Does it mean that Michael Golden was in the habit of tearing up all of his original artwork when it was returned to him? Absolutely not. It makes for much better print to paint someone as a crazy like this though, and given the fact that by 1987, there weren't an inordinate amount of originals available, teamed with Michael Golden's virtual public silence and steadfast refusal to grant interviews, there wasn't really anyone around to dispel these myths and they began to spread like wildfire over the next decade. People having access to and profiting off of his art after it had been published did become a pretty big thing for Michael Golden at one point and it's actually the main reason that originals from him were so hard to come across for so many years. And after a lot of digging, I can honestly say I think this is the second missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to the widespread belief that Michael Golden destroyed his original artwork. Fairly early on in his career, at some point during the height of the Micronauts craze, Golden was contacted by someone looking to buy pages. Golden, who has never been a fan of selling his art anyway, liked the pages that the guy was asking to buy, and he wanted to keep them initially declining the offer. Golden says that this guy kept after him, though, and that eventually the potential buyer, who was supposedly this massive Micronauts fan, managed to sweet-talk him into parting with the pieces in question. Now, Golden has never said that he cut the guy some insane deal or anything, but I'll say this. I talked to a guy who ran in the Golden right around this same period in the 80s. He was eyeing some Doctor Strange pages, but when he asked how much they were, it actually turned out that he didn't even have enough for either one. Instead of telling him to take a hike, Michael Golden sold the guy who was obviously a fan and really loved his stuff both pages for what he did have, which was apparently something like 40 bucks a piece. Michael Golden has long since been repulsed by the whole cult worship hero status thing that many fans attach to their favorite writers and artists, but I don't think that he's immune to the joy that his work brings to his fans either, no matter what he or others might have you believe. Unlike the guy who picked up the Doctor Strange pages, who still treasures them 30 plus years later and goes out of his way to share that story, I might add, it turned out that this other so-called Micronauts fan who managed to talk Michael Golden out of these really sweet pages that he did not want to get rid of to begin with, flipped them 
all, almost immediately, in a pretty public manner, and for a fairly significant profit at that, according to Michael Golden. While Golden has never gone into specifics about the entire thing, it apparently left such a sour, nasty taste in his mouth that he refused steadfastly to sell his original art in almost all cases for nearly 20 years following this. Because of this, there was virtually no new Michael Golden work hitting the secondhand market for decades, creating a sense of scarcity that no one could seem to explain because they couldn't talk to the reclusive artist to even ask about it. This was yet another thing that helped add fuel to the rumors that Michael Golden destroyed his original artwork when it was returned to him rather than sell or do anything else with it. As it turns out, Michael Golden simply didn't enjoy the process of monetizing his original art to begin with and definitely didn't want to see it end up in the hands of greedy flippers who were looking to make a quick buck and buying into the hero status cult worship stuff that he hated so much about the industry and its deification of artists. While these widespread rumors about Michael Golden and his behavior continued to spread until they became beliefs that many begun to hold against Michael Golden were starting to catch up with him by the late 1980s, he still had one last final masterpiece up his sleeve. One of the most trying and difficult stories of his entire career with the work spread across quite literally the better part of an entire decade. Michael Golden was about to unleash something absolutely jaw-dropping on the unsuspecting world. Next week, we're going to get into one of Michael Golden's final crowning achievements, a book that, like many of his other seminal works, is not only still widely respected today, but was created under some of the most bizarre and trying circumstances that you're likely to come across. But we'll get into all of that next week. For now, I hope you all enjoyed, maybe even learned something. If you did like what you saw, make sure you hit that like button. Think about getting in the comment section below and letting me know. If you really liked what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you feel like you're in a position to help the channel grow, think about using the link in the description below to sign up for my Patreon page. Remember, donations and other subscriptions make future episodes possible. For as little as $3 a month, you get access to behind the scenes posts, early access to scripts and audio for episodes before they're ever uploaded anywhere else, and you can even get your name in the credits here. If Patreon is not your thing, but you still want to support the channel, have no fear. You can sign up for membership right here on YouTube and get access to the scripts and audio as well, or you can even use the Ko-Fi link in the description to make one-time donations. If that's not enough, you can even pick up your very own Jerk Comic shirts like the ones you see on the screen now. As always, this has been a product of the Jerk Broadcasting System and brought to you by the generous grants from the viewers you see on the screen now. I'd like to personally thank my loyal Wednesday warriors as well as Burn Miller, Larry Nolan, and Shane Whitbread for research assistance and help tracking down interviews and articles, plus all of the members that you see on the screen again for making this series possible to begin with. I know it took me a while to get this one done and I hope it's been worth it. I can't wait for you all to see the rest of this series. Thanks again for sticking with me and as always, I really, truly, and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics. <laughs>